A lot of legislators are, I mean, we hate to be rude and crude about it, but it's about keeping their jobs at the Capitol as opposed to keeping their jobs with the people that elected them there. Our industry is under attack right now, and so it's very important that we're using our voice as a collective group to lobby on behalf of the Realtor Party. We're already in a very strapped economy, right, for many people. It's very difficult for consumers to understand when they're arguing emotionally against the people that build things. They're actually arguing against themselves because they're eventually going to pay for it. When your taxes go up and your property insurance goes up, you may be barely qualified for that house three years ago, and now you can't afford to make the payments for the mortgages. You have to have insurance in order to be able to have a mortgage. And while there is a state plan that will be coming online in 2025, our understanding as of right now that a homeowner would have to be Hi, my name is Weldon Shaver. I'm the current chair of the Public Policy Committee with uh, Dr. Clarissa Thomas, who is our Government Affairs Director. And so we are going to start our monthly podcast today and tell you what's going on with the Public Policy Committee. So, Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I think that this is going to be a great opportunity not only for Weldon and I to share with you like some of the behind the scenes things that we do politically speaking in our industry, but also how public policy and politics really impact real estate and home ownership, private property rights, the free enterprise system, and all the things that our industry really and truly um, dives deeply in year in and year out to make sure that we're advocating for homeowners. Correct, and we had our first meeting yesterday of the new year and we actually had a great turnout. I think we had close to 35 or 40 people on the call. Due to the weather, we had to do it via Zoom, but we usually meet the second Monday of every month in the conference room downstairs on the first floor at PBAR. And so we just kicked off, got introductions out of the way at this meeting, and kind of laid out the framework of what we're going to be watching in the coming year with the state legislature, which their session kicks off today i believe tomorrow tomorrow yeah the 10th okay and so they they start gearing up today technically with minority majority um house and senate fund parties people tend to have a lot of political you know kick off the session it's kind of like getting back to school that's exactly how politics works and many times we relate to the first day of the session as being legislators so grown-ups being back at school and and you know you have your cliques and you have your you know your fun groups your very serious policy people, the ones that are ready to hit the pavement running at the Capitol, making sure that they're doing the business of the people. So just like we would, you know, we get a kick out of and you know being involved in politics. It's like those of you that have kids that you watch for, it's you having to get back to school. We get back to the Capitol and have to make sure that we are monitoring, tracking, getting involved in things that are really impacting realtors' ability to, to make a living the regulatory framework that impacts all of our industry. And uh, like we said, it's how we make sure that home ownership keeps thriving and private property rights are at the essence of our constitutional framework in this country and not only in our state, but also in El Paso County. That's what we care about. And this is why we do what we do and realtors gather together every single month to make sure that we are advocating for you, the realtor and the homeowner. And I think this, new session is going to be very interesting. You might talk a little bit, Clarissa, about how we get involved through PPAR with the Legislative Policy Council with the state and that we get people from PPAR and other associations to be involved in that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the Colorado Association of Realtors um, opens applications on a yearly basis for members of the real estate community to apply directly through them and with them to if they have an interest in politics, if they have a particular background or policy area that they care about, if they're experts in, in say, commercial real estate pro um, property management, um, special districts, any particular area that folks have a particular interest in or expertise, CAR really looks for that. And they are very keen on making sure that they bring out those expertises and so that they can fill this committee that is about 41 to 44 people 
This year, the committee is actually 77 people. It was the largest that, um, but only 41 of those, I believe, 41 to 44, are the actual voting members of this committee. Correct. And so these group of individuals get together during the legislative session. So they will begin their work next Friday. I believe it's the 19th, but they officially begin to meet next Friday. Every single member serves on a subcommittee that um, delves a little bit further into the details of a specific policy, whether it's educational policy, tax policy, business um, related matters, housing, then water and so and regulatory. And so all these areas are how legislation gets assigned even at the Capitol healthcare, you know, it's there's different committees. And so these members serve on these subcommittees that end up through varying degrees analyzing this public policy and how it impacts real estate and home ownership. And so um, we have about six people from PPAR that will be representing PPAR at the Colorado Association of Realtors for the duration of the legislative session. And actually the work of this committee goes on pretty much through the end of the year. It's a year appointment. And because they'll continue looking then at legislative records to make sure that you know, legislators get recognized for their work that they do on behalf of what it, we call the Realtor Party, which is not partisan politics or partisan derived. We look at legislative accomplishments based on how people represent us at the Capitol from a Realtor Party perspective. And that is, again, the lens that we see and analyze things in our world is do people really and truly embrace private property rights, home ownership, the free enterprise system? And so that's how politics is the center of the real estate world. It's, you know, oftentimes we get labeled that it's about either Republicans or Democrats. And it really is just through the lens of the realtor party politics, which is a very bipartisan approach to things. And, and that is how we measure legislative accomplishments, how we get involved in making sure that we can defeat legislation or advance legislation at the state, actually the local level as well, but national politics. Yes. And so that's one of the benefits of being a member of the realtor organization and also supporting Colorado Association of Realtors as well as the National Association of Realtors with your dues payments is to help lobby on behalf of the realtor party, which I think is something that a lot of our members don't realize. We're one of the largest um, groups that have a seat at the table to lobby on behalf of our industry. And our industry is under attack right now. And so it's important that we're involved. It's very important that we're monitoring what's going on and that we're using our voice as a collective group to lobby on behalf of the realtor party right. and property rights and those types of things. That right. Closely. And not only that, you know, we always tell people that home ownership is something very sacred. Like I said, it's at the center of our constitutional framework in the United States. And so we work very hard as realtors to make sure that we're advocating for mom and pop, the folks that are looking for a home and they want to be able to own that piece of the American dream. And when folks challenge whether the American dream is still very much alive, we say, if you aspire to own a home and you end up owning a home, you are very much part of that American yep. dream. And so it's at the center of everything that we do. Homeowners, homeowner associations, they might have an angle of, you know, within your neighborhoods, you might have an HOA that helps you, but collectively realtors are that voice. Not only are we the voice of real estate, but we are the voice of home ownership, and we make sure that people and individuals seeking to have a home are represented in the political and advocacy forum. And so, you know, we take our unified voice of 1.5 million people within our across the spectrum around the country and try to work in broader coalitions with home builders, with apartment associations, locally with chambers, with um, downtown partnerships, groups like that, that make sure that we are representing a broader swath of the population and try to get people's message across to make not only our communities that we live in better, but our state and our country. And so if you know we are there as we do it because it's not just about our business, it's about making sure that people's private property rights and home ownership are protected. Yep, exactly. And one of the things we do at every meeting is we discuss the local issues, state issues, mm -hmm. as well as the national or federal issues. So 
Is there anything where you're seeing on the horizon we need to be paying attention to at the yeah. local and state level? Sure. So locally, obviously, we it's it's a three you know tier approach to our political advocacy, and it's politics. Politics is usually the side of things when elections kick in, but the policy side of things. And so in policy, we're looking at legislation and locally would be ordinances, things that our city council or county commission is looking at, our utilities board, which is a regulatory framework. So we're making sure that things don't get more burdensome to be able to own a home, <clears throat> a home excuse me. So we have, we're monitoring very carefully what the utilities public advisory committee, which is a citizen appointed uh, board to the utilities committee, um, to make sure that they don't uh, create or uh, put forth more undue burdensome regulations on homeowners or owning property. And they've been studying for the past year what would be a cost recovery. And so the impetus for that is that for years, um, all of utilities, not just the Colorado Springs utilities, but all utilities around the, the state have been um, having to comply with mandates from the federal and the state level of governments. And so when it boils down to our local utilities, they have to be able to meet the demands that have been implemented through either legislation or the Public Utilities Commission. So this whole, you know, moving towards a faster approach to green energy and sustainability then obviously creates cost, you know, related matters for our local um, utility. And so we are a citizen ratepayer utility or city owned. And so all the citizens of Colorado Springs own utilities here. Mm -hmm. And so we own it, but that means that we all have to share in this burden of responsibility for making sure that our utility, you know, either contracts or expands. And so with more population, there's growing demands, whether it's, you know, the electric grid, gas, you name it. And so we are one of those few utilities that actually delivers, what is it, wastewater, electrical. So everything is, is all water. contained. In, yeah, so wastewater, water, gas, electric, all in one. And with that, like I said, the needs of what the state and the federal end up submitting forth to utilities have to be shifted down. And so who does it get shifted down to? There's a mentality that, you know, because development is happening and there's growth happening, therefore it has to be the industry that bears that cost. And so oftentimes we are the industry, right? right. Realtors are part of the industry, but so are homeowners in this case because they're the rate payers. And so while there may be a disconnect of how costs get absorbed, you know, the normal thing is like, well, development is happening. Developers need to pay for it. And so our line of defense is always, well, developers are going to pass the cost down to the consumer because developer is only the transaction. They're the ones making a building happen. Mm -hmm. But who's purchasing a home or who's living in a home? It's the homeowner. So this is where people sometimes don't understand, like emotions get in the way. And it's like, well, we need to make those those evil, you know, developers and real just pay for things. But they're not understanding that it's really not them. In essence, it's going to be the homeowner, the rate right. payer in Colorado Springs. For us, it's been something that we've been advocating for the past year in various meetings that we are concerned that while the disconnect is that the cost of development has to be borne by the developer, we say, well, you're kind of forgetting that there's only so much that the rate payer can actually incur. And we're already in a very strapped economy, right, for many people. Yep. They're living pay to, you know, paycheck to paycheck. There's, you know, this notion that inflation is really not happening, but yet we see the cost of, of what it is to go to the supermarket, what it is to pay for the utilities, what it is to pay for gas, even though gas has come down a little bit. It's, it's very difficult for consumers to understand that when they're arguing emotionally against the people that build things, they're actually arguing against themselves because they're eventually going to pay for it. So that is our, our first priority here locally, making sure that the consumer doesn't have to bear any excess cost in this um, reshifting of, of recovery fees for the utilities. And so we, we're mindful that the utilities needs to be able to expand, adapt to the growing needs of our community, but we don't want the consumer to pay more than they have to. And so that, as realtors, we're working with our community partners, the Home Builders Apartment Association, the Downtown Partnership, um, and the Chamber of Commerce to make sure that ratepayers are represented through and through 
because they are the ones that will bear this responsibility. So that is locally. Statewide, we are very um, concerned with land use stuff that we're becoming, land use policy that we're becoming down from the state to the local, you know, to the local level as, again, mandates that the state would be telling people, we think best how you should be developing your, you know, your areas of, of the state. And so there are many things that we agree with our state legislature and how they approach things. They want to make things better and adaptable and a little bit more nimble when it comes to um, meeting the demands of a growing population state, but we cannot usurp people's private property rights in order to be able to adapt or manage, you know, statewide expectations because we are the citizens of this community and we have worked very hard in Colorado Springs and El Paso County to make sure that we grow with our needs and within our means. And so those are the things that we're concerned about, that it's not unfunded mandates, that it's not mandates that become burdensome to our, burdensome to our population. And then we're also concerned with um, rent control uh, narratives that suggest that it's cheaper to impart rent control when in reality, unfunded rent control becomes again something that straps people in or pigeonholes, if I can say that, pigeonholes people in a property and then there's um, a disconnect as to how those properties that are now blocked into certain rates will not be able to go outside of that bandwidth. And so it's kind of like a pressure cooker, right? That you're saying this is the only growth that you can expect. And it feels good and it sounds really good, but then the pressure cooker doesn't have anywhere else to go. And so it creates the wrong um, predisposition for a community that the free market would actually be able to adapt. You know, so if there's an oversupply of housing, prices are gonna go down, whereas, you know, we're gonna go ahead and, and fix the price of this unit to this amount and you can't charge anymore. And then if the demand is no longer there, what's it gonna do, right? So those are things that we're concerned about at the state. Um, Along those same yeah. lines, um, one of the things that I think we need to make sure that we're communicating to the legislators is when they impose, like Clarissa was talking about, these, these uh, mandates and they start limiting the supply of, of rental properties, that drives up the price. And so you can't compete and, and the mom and pops that own properties that do rentals, they'll sell them off and they won't keep them. So when you reduce the supply and the demand stays high, the price will never go down unless you try to artificially make it go down. Okay. Same with the recouping of the cost by the developer for utilities. That's not going to change when you start limiting or telling them you're going to have to uh, pay these extra fees. They're just not going to build houses, and that's why we have the problem we have. Our prices have skyrocketed for housing. Our supply has not increased. Only place supply is coming from is a developer or a builder, and they're not going to build houses because it's economically unfeasible to do so. And so there's a lot of unintended consequences that come with this type of legislation, and one size does not fit all. So what works in Denver County and what works in Boulder does not work in Trinidad. It does not work on the Western Slope. It does not work in Eastern Colorado. And I would say it doesn't even work here in El Paso County. All right, so it, it's very complex and, and that is the difference of why we always, I mean, it, it's, it's great to, to criticize or throw stones against people if they don't know exactly, you know, what goes in, you know, to the policy making, you know, field. And so, you know, this is why we encourage our realtors and, and citizens to really be mindful and critical in thought you know just because you see it on the internet doesn't mean that it's true you know take take it to heart to do the research to look at both sides you know what are people really arguing for and i mean this is why realtors are are and have been my favorite industry to be involved with in my in my experience of politics because it's grassroots citizens looking out for the consumer in, you know, so it's in the pursuit of, of obviously making the real estate industry better, but it's entirely about the consumer. It's about making sure that that dream of homeownership thrives. And so 
the lens of the business owner in this case is the lens of the moms and pops. Mm -hmm. And we are an industry comprised of, of small businesses. There might be some larger corporations. And when I say that, it's, you know, hedge fund groups have actually obviously gotten into the real estate world. And there's this misconception that apartments are all owned by corporations. And in reality, the majority of the people that we work with are the small mom and pops. And so it's the small consumer that ends up buying a property or a duplex or a fourplex or a home, and then they want to leave some sort of a real estate asset to their family, you know, a generational building of wealth. And then many of these folks are being pushed out because of the burdens and the, you know, the regulatory burdens in the industry or in our environment. And so those properties get picked up by the larger corporations. So we, in essence, are creating, a, you know, those doom and gloom situations where people think that that's what controls us. And yet that's exactly what we're doing. We're creating that environment because people are not understanding that we are a world of mom and pops. You know, for the most part, we're a world of independent contractors, of small businesses. And yet when we are forcing all these regulations, we're pushing out the small people that can afford to work in this small, you know, collegial, um, you know, very open network and driving it away from them and towards the corporations that have the big legal counsel offices, you know, the big representation and and that's not what we want to see. We want to continue being an industry of small mom and pop businesses and individuals that are able to achieve and attain and retain that dream of home ownership. Yeah. Well, there are a couple of other things we're seeing that are happening in the state and obviously property taxes, I think everyone is aware of and that Prop HH failed miserably at the ballot box, but yet they're still gonna push forward with trying to parcel that out. So we're monitoring that. The other thing we're seeing is insurance carriers are pulling out of Colorado. So when your insurance, when you have a payment on your house, it's a principal interest taxes and insurance. When your taxes go up double or triple, and your property insurance goes up by another 30 to 40%, you may be barely qualified for that house three years ago, and now you can't afford to make the payments for the mortgages. So that's gonna be another problem. And when we see insurance companies basically saying, we're not gonna insure you anymore, and then you try to find insurance and find out it's either not available or mm -hmm. you can't afford it, and your lender says, well, hey, you've gotta have insurance on the property or I'm gonna, call your loan due. So that's another big issue that I think we're going to be seeing that needs to be addressed by the state legislators. Yeah, and I wouldn't doubt that that's, I mean, that's been a point of discussion that the insurance industry, and that's not only a Colorado problem, we're seeing it nationally, places where the insurance rates are going through the roof and homeowners are either, it, especially in, in areas where it, it's, you know, prone to floods, natural disasters. You know, Colorado was not conceived for, for, for many years to be one of those states, right? right? Because we're landlocked. And then we've had some, you know, pretty devastating wildfires in our state. Mm -hmm. And then when rains come, hail. then we have the hail, we have all these different things. And those scar zones or the burn scars have become pretty easily accessible to them or easily prone to becoming flood areas. And then obviously we have the flood plains. And so within that, many people are struggling with wildfire mitigation type of insurance. They're struggling with, with reciting within newly um, modified or adjusted FEMA floodplain maps and insurance companies that are saying the cost of doing business in Colorado is such that we're not gonna insure you. I don't think anybody really thought that Colorado, like suburban Colorado, would be hit by a tornado this past summer. And yet suburban, southwest suburban Denver ended up getting hit by a tornado. And then that's another topic of conversation. So yeah. we are now experiencing so many different types of weather patterns in Colorado that, you know, the insurance companies are saying, see ya. Yeah. And and homeowners are being left yeah. to carry the water. So when you're talking about that rate of affordability and it's not affordable, 
you have to have insurance in order to be able to have a mortgage. And so that conversation we know is going to happen. And while there is a state plan that will be coming online in 2025, there are certain criteria in order for homeowners to be able to qualify for those types of plans. And so it is our understanding as of right now that a homeowner would have to be rejected three times before they qualify for the state. Um, it's kind of like the last saving grace state uh, funded plan. And so we don't know all the details. Obviously, that's still being hashed out because the plan will not be online until 2025. But there's going to be a lot of discussions leading up to it. And what obviously happens this year, 2024, it's an election cycle. So a lot of legislators are, I mean, we hate to be rude and crude about it, but it's about keeping their jobs at the Capitol as opposed to keeping their jobs with the people that elected them there. And this is the beauty of being involved in politics that our folks are so passionate about getting down and dirty that we see both sides of it, right? The political aspect of things and we see the policy side. And so it's important to make sure that you're holding legislators feet to the fire. And when they say one thing during the, their campaigns, it's making sure that, that when they get elected to office that we're holding them accountable for that. And that's why I said a lot of things are going to be said that, that sound really nice in 2024, but it's a really big year. And not only do we have all state legislative house raises, we have com um, commissioner districts at the county level, we've got Senate seats, we've got congressional races, we've got presidential races. I mean, a presidential race, but I call it races because we start with you know, the presidential primary, then we have the actual statewide primaries in the summer, and then the general election. So it's a really busy political year. And I, you know, I, I guess I would press upon you know, our listeners and, and our membership that it's really not about so much what we feel. You, know, you might like somebody because they align with you politically on everything. And, and you might not like somebody and so you're gonna, you know, just shut them out. But it's sometimes better to, to be placed in an uncomfortable position and say, okay, I'm stepping out of my comfort zone to listen what both sides say, as opposed to just tuning them off, because it really is about metering and being very critical in thought of every single thing and policy that people talk about. Because at least for us, and that's why I said, we focus on the realtor party aspect of things. And so we have to look at things from, you know, bipartisan perspective, if I can say that, because it is about, you know, electing people that represent our industry and the consumer and the homeowner. Right. Whereas looking at things from a partisan perspective, because partisan politics are what makes things tick and people get elected partisanly, but they need to legislate from a very... Um, compromising center of the road and that is where people are being you know dr driven away from politics because nothing is happening in in a middle of a road perspective right now everything is happening in the extremes and it's not good for the consumer it's not good for our country and it's certainly not good for for any policy environment doesn't matter if it's Colorado it's it's nationally everybody's struggling with with the partisan divides at the extremes as opposed to really coming together and focusing on on the best interest of the country. We, we need to find that uh, lost middle because they seem to not be around anymore. So right. as you can see, we have a lot on our plate coming up for 2024 at the Public Policy Committee. And as I said, we meet the second Monday of every month at 8.30 in the morning here at PPAR. Um, we try to get the meetings over in an hour, but it may be tough once we start seeing the legislation that's being proposed in Denver and our LPC folks are telling us what they're looking at, monitoring, opposing, or um, just saying we're okay with. So um, we thank you for your time. We hope you'll tune into the podcast. We're going to do this every month, and uh, it will hopefully be informative for you. Yeah, sometimes it will be funner than others, um, sometimes denser because it's politics, but, you know, we do it to make sure that we're protecting your, your business and protecting your consumers. And so we hope that you tune in and, and help yourselves, help your consumers, and help us be able to, to be 
a more unified voice um, for the protection of private property rights.